Welcome to the local campaign here on Rogers TV. Thank you so much for joining us. Of course, an important election coming up, Election Day, October the 24th. And as we get closer to Election Day, we turn our attention to municipal debates. Today's debate, Ward 16, River Ward. And before we introduce you to our candidates, I'll go over the format for everybody at home and of course for our can candidates here in studio. We're gonna start off with an opening statement. Each of the candidates will have 60 seconds for that. The order of that was chosen at random just a few moments ago. Following the opening statements, we'll get into the debate portion. Um, I will ask a question to a candidate in that order. Uh, they will have 45 seconds to open the discussion themselves, and then once that 45 seconds is done, each candidate will have an opportunity to debate each other. Um, it's, an, it's an open floor at that point. At the end of the debate portion, um, I'll go back to the candidate with whom I originally asked the question. They will have 30 seconds to wrap up. So we'll go through a lot of different topics, of course, topics that are important to residents in the ward and residents across the entire city of Ottawa. Once we are done the debate portion, each candidate will have an opportunity to share a closing statement. They will get 60 seconds for their closing statement as well. So let's introduce you to our candidates for River Ward, starting with Ethan Sabarin. Welcome, Ethan. Thanks very much. Alex Dugal. Alex, welcome. And Riley Brockington. Welcome, Riley. Thank you all for being here. We really appreciate your time today. Um, Ethan, we'll start with you with the opening statement. You have 60 seconds. Thanks so much, Derek. I want to acknowledge first that we're standing on unceded Algonquin Anishinaabe land as we undertake this debate. My name is Ethan. I'm a policy analyst, climate policy analyst, born and raised in Ottawa, and I've been living in River Ward for almost 15 years. While I was away at the University of Waterloo, I studied design and systems planning and then earned my master's degree in climate change. Since then, I've been fighting for a better Ottawa against wasteful sprawl and for a more affordable and caring city. City Council is failing to meet its most basic goals, from alleviating homelessness to creating safe streets to climate action. And we can see the outcomes of this status quo. More people on our streets, more dangerous crashes, and more massive storms. That's why Ottawa needs a Green New Deal. We can invest in decarbonizing our buildings and transportation while improving connectivity and quality of life. We can invest in our community services, which care for us, and we can stop the pattern that subsidizes inefficient development and sells off public goods to private shareholders. We deserve a new vision for the city where we tackle crises head on and exceed expectations. Thank you very much, Ethan. Alex, over to you. You have 60 seconds. Yes, hello. Thank you. Uh, my name is Alex Degal. Um, I'm from, originally from Newfoundland. I live here in the city now for the past six years. I live, work, and play here in the city. Um, when the, uh, the, I guess a lot of people decided not to run this council, there's going to be a lot of leadership change. Uh, I decided to be part of that change group and put my name forward, so I'm excited to be here. Uh, I think the city's got a lot of great things going on and there's opportunity to improve it. Um, like Ethan's just hit on, transportation's a big one, the city's sprawled out. We have to live with the decisions that previous groups have made, but we need to make sure that the decisions that we as a, hopefully the new council going forward make those decisions so that the future generations don't have the same level of problems that you know this council is going to have to deal with. They've got a transportation system that needs to be fixed, they've got a lot of uh, housing issues that need to be addressed, and they've got a city that's sprawled out that now needs to be intensified, and un unfortunately the group that's here now is going to be the group to do that. So I'd, I'd like to be the councillor to represent River Ward. I'm excited to put my name forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Alex, over to you, Riley. You have 60 seconds. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Riley Brockington and I am running for re-election as the City Councillor in River Ward. Thank you to Rogers 22 for hosting this forum. And I do want to acknowledge that we are on the unceded, never surrendered territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe First Nations people. I'm a father of two. I live in the Moonies Bay neighborhood of River Ward. I'm an economics graduate from the University of Ottawa senior analyst and economist with the world's leading statistical agency and extensive volunteer in the community before I was elected. I believe that an effective city councillor has the ability to make positive changes in residents' lives every single day. I strongly believe in community engagement and consultation, local collaboration. We have some very serious matters that we need to address in the next term of council. I'm ready to tackle that with you. Let's roll up our sleeves and tackle these serious issues. Thank you. All right, thank you very much to all of you. Um, so we'll begin the debate portion. Ethan, I will start with you. First question is on affordable housing. I, I believe you touched on it in your opening statement. Um, 
What solutions can you bring to the table when it comes to affordable housing and in particular affordable rental housing? You have 45 seconds to open the topic. Look, Ottawa needs a Green New Deal for housing. Our current approach, delivering massive handouts to developers alongside minor investments in affordable housing is clearly failing. Instead, we should strive to build a public and non-profit option for all, including through the delivery of many more affordable and supportive housing units. The key tools I will use to tackle our housing emergency are a build-out of beautiful green housing, strong financing for nonprofits and co-ops, and major city support for community land trusts. A public developer and a more thoughtful approach to public land can help build out this new community-focused approach alongside new tenant protections. Ottawa should also make use of every dollar of federal funding to build nonprofit housing which will stay permanently affordable, something we have neglected to do in the current council. All right, thank you very much. I open the floor to all candidates. Feel free to jump in. Yeah, I do believe that we need federal dollars to assist here. Municipalities across the province, let alone country, cannot afford to meet the housing needs on their own. We need significant housing dollars, but allow municipalities to decide how to spend that dollars and who to partner with. We need inclusionary zoning. We need legislation to allow municipalities to have developments, large developments have inclusionary zoning. That is affordable housing. Right now it is not mandatory and developers do not want to do it. They do not want to build it. This needs to be part of the equation. We need to look at how the downtown is going to evolve and the amount of property the federal government owns and if the federal government can yield buildings that can be used for housing. This has to be part of the conversation early on. And we also can't forget we have to fix existing stock. There has to be investment in current affordable housing and social housing for existing tenants in those units. Alex, do you want to get in here? I totally agree with that. I think we need to think outside the box. We've got a big shift that happened over the last couple of years where a lot of uh, buildings downtown became vacant. We've had some big anchor tenants who did large facilities. We've got the federal government who recently back in the last 10 years consolidated over 50 different uh, leases that encompass the National Defense Headquarters Group. They moved them all to Carling. So there's a lot of real estate down there that if we were to think outside the box, we could probably come up with a uh, much better um, affordable housing options. We need to use the Ottawa Community Housing um, nonprofit uh, corporation as a corporation. There's federal money that's out there. We can go through CMHC, we can go after green grants. We don't need to wait necessarily for the handouts. We need to use that uh, corporation and, and empower those guys so that they can build a lot more housing. You know, they get $50 million to, to build housing in the last couple of years. We need to give them a lot more money. They need to um, have those assets. You know, if we were to put $50 million into housing three years ago, that $50 million would be worth $150 million today with just the housing increases that we've seen. Ethan? I think that Alex is exactly right. We should be using our city corporations to build more housing. We shouldn't let uh, only private companies take over our housing market. We, we deserve an option that doesn't necessarily deliver that, that extra market rent to shareholders, but where the city builds market rent apartments and uses those, you know, those extra profits to subsidize our uh, low income and affordable housing stock. If we built a system that was self-sustaining like this, not only could we take profit out of the equation for housing, we could also protect more tenants and build housing that's, that's accessible to all. I'll just add that the city of Ottawa this term of council has declared housing and homelessness an emergency in our city. This is an acknowledgement that all three candidates before you are agreeing on. Uh, the, what it comes down to in many cases is the actual cost of building affordable housing. And so again to look to the federal government which is the, the largest uh, level of government that have funds we need a national funding strategy that can help municipalities use the assets and corporations that all already exist locally but we need funding municipalities cannot do this on their own and look to the federal government for ways to do that I think uh, we need i'll let more. alex in because ethan you'll have a chance to wrap oh, yeah. well. i think we probably need to go a little further than that riley we, we can't just wait for the handouts we need to be more aggressive there's cities that are out there that are are being much more proactive. There's countries that have solved homelessness problems and affordability problems uh, long before we declared it was an emergency. So we probably need to take it a step further and rather than just declare an emergency, actually work on the emergency and come up with some options that are outside the box and, and think of how we can make it so that their assets are owned by us. There's no point in going and, and building large developments that are no longer owned by us for future generations that affordable housing um, contracts are signed to give 10 years or 20 years. All we're doing is delaying the problem 10 or 20 years. If they're affordable housing from the start, there'll be affordable housing at the end. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I'll, I'll close it there and uh, come back here to Ethan. You'll have 30 seconds to wrap. 
A robust public option and a new standard for livable neighborhoods will help make developers work for us. We can build those publicly owned mixed use in or mixed income apartments, cooperatively owned towers, community owned neighborhoods, and more beautiful public space. All the while, we can prevent the loss of affordable housing, protect tenants, and create a city that is truly accessible and inviting to everyone. Ottawa is going to grow. Let's be smart about it. We can make Ottawa an affordable and attractive option for professionals, young families, increasingly priced out of Canada's other major cities. Thank you very much. Thanks to all the candidates. Uh, Alex, you'll start off this next one. You'll have 45 seconds for the topic. Um, let's talk about the condition of roads because many, many residents complain, in particular in, in your ward and, and right across the city. How do we make sure the worst of those roads are prioritized and scheduling it around other infrastructure construction, which is is, is something that frustrates so many residents. Alex, you have 45 seconds to open. I, I think road, uh, road issues are going to be issues in every ward. They're going to be issues for forever. Unfortunately, our climate in Canada doesn't really allow us to build a road and then just forget about it. So we need to make sure that when we build, build something that we are building quality roads, that we're, we're building not to, to last five years or 10 years, but we're looking down the line to address climate change as well. You know, if you look over to Europe, they've had to shut down airports this year because the airports, were, the runways were melting. So we need to think and we need to build our infrastructure to make sure that climate change is not going to affect it so that we're not re reinvesting in years to come to rebuild the same roads. Next on top of that, we need to incorporate maintenance plans. We need to communicate those out to the communities. We, there's nothing worse than trying to plan things around ad hoc construction when the communities aren't aware of it. So we need to make sure we're fixing it properly and make sure communicating. Thank you, Alex. Out. I open it up to all candidates. Yeah, the transportation network in this city obviously includes roads, but it also includes active transportation, sidewalks, bike lanes, multi-use pathways, We need and public transit. And we need to be able to shuttle goods and people across our city effectively and efficiently. The fact of the matter is this has been underfunded for years when a tax rate was capped at 2%. This term of council, we went up to 3%, an additional percentage, a point went towards infrastructure. But uh, one, this is one of the main issues that we hear from people in the community is the state of our roads and active transportation network. There's obviously more investment this year. It's not enough. It has to be a prolonged investment, but you also have to balance that over other priorities. So roads are very important, but also people need to be able to get out their front door and get to the grocery store, get to school, get to the community center. There has to be equal concern and investment, frankly, in our active transportation, our sidewalk networks, our multi-use pathways, our bike networks. Thank you, Riley. Uh, Ethan? I completely agree with everything that Riley said. Um, you know, but, but when we're talking about roads, we have to think about, it's not just winter that wears on our roads. It's the thousands of cars that are driving on them every single day. And we are increasing that number every time that we sprawl out, every time that we expand our urban boundary and build new developments on Greenfield that are totally car dependent. You know, when, when we build all the way down Riverside, or down uh, Riverside Drive, we're ending up putting those cars right on roads that are coming through Riverward, the same when we build out west. Um, so I think, you know, it's, it's time that we start planning for a city that, uh, that doesn't rely entirely on cars, where we can build livable, dense neighborhoods for, for everyone. Um, and that also means building safe streets, including that cycling infrastructure. Um, you know, in Montreal, they're able to create safe streets that are, that are beautiful, with beautiful intersections and green planters all around. Why can't we make those same decisions here? I totally agree. You know, our, our, our climate's the exact same, give or take. We're pretty close. So you would think that if they can do it a couple of hours away from us, why can't we do it here? I mean, we're the capital city of the, you know, the greatest country in the world. Our city streets should be the safest. Our city streets should be the prettiest. You should be able to drive not only from our houses to downtown and not worry about potholes, but you know, we get a lot of people that visit this country from other countries and they should see us as a leading example. They shouldn't come to Ottawa and see potholes all over the road. They shouldn't see constant uh, you know, wear and tear on the roads. They shouldn't have to deal with, um, I guess, uh, infrastructure that's falling apart. We need to do a much better job to make sure people can get from A to B and not have to worry about um, their vehicle coming apart. It's all fine and dandy to keep taxes low, but you know when people are spending $500 to fix a tire because the potholes are, aren't there, wouldn't we have been better to just raise the taxes a little bit and fix the roads to begin with? Alex, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let Riley jump in here because you'll have a chance to wrap. Go ahead. Yeah, I just want to say that the City of Ottawa owns a number of assets, and in the context of the question with roads, they have to be maintained. Yeah. 
Uh, we're not talking about expanding roads, we're talking about maintaining current assets. It's not safe for drivers when they're pothole ridden. It's not safe for cyclists who are passing cars, who are swerving around potholes. It's, it's frankly not safe. So council has to allocate sufficient resources to maintain its existing assets, and that includes roads, safer roads, more efficient in the city, but also to never forget about sidewalks, multi-use pathways, and the bike network. Ethan, you want to jump in? And when we're talking about you know, sidewalks and multi-use pathways, there are going to be a lot of new neighborhoods being built in and around River Ward in the next uh, decade, probably. We're, we're looking at the around the Merrivale Triangle, perhaps a new dense mixed-use neighborhood at South Keys, and also at Confederation Heights. These are all going to be places where we can create the roads that people love, main streets with businesses, with shade, with amenities that people need, like a new library in the ward. So uh, I think that we've got a lot of opportunities, both inside River Ward and just on our boundaries, to create uh, safe roads, but also roads that people can love. Excellent. All right. Uh, we'll wrap there. Uh, back to you, though, Alex. You have 30 seconds to wrap up. Here. Hey, thank you. Yeah, uh, transportation around the city, it's, it's like Riley has said. It's an asset. It's a government asset, something we as taxpayers paid for. They're going to continue to pay for it forever. Yeah, if you personally owned it and it was starting to fall apart, you'd do preventative maintenance and you'd try to do it to make sure that you, your repairs down the road. So I think, unfortunately, it's a cost that we need to look at that needs to be better assigned and, and better tracked. And, and now is the time for us to spend the money to get it fixed to make sure that for future years the roads aren't falling apart. If we spend the money now and invest in it, we'll have it for enjoying forever. We can build it for the big developments that are coming. Thank you very much. Thanks to all candidates. Uh, Riley, you'll start off this next topic. Let's talk public transportation. Um, the LRT and, and the bus system, uh, many people feel, has been a, a disaster. Um, what are some of the solutions in, in solving this public transportation issue? You have 45 seconds to open up the topic. It has absolutely been a challenging term of office, not just for members of council, but for the people of Ottawa, the taxpayers who have paid for a public transit LRT system, but also our users, our passengers. Reliability is the Achilles heel for OC Transpo. Reliability issues did not start this term of council. They have been a chronic issue not just with LRT, but with our bus and with paratranspo. I would like to see the Auditor General of Ottawa audit the scheduling of OC Transpo and the timetabling of OC Transpo. There are a number of issues that contribute to the reliability of the system, but we need to wrap our head around these chronic issues with scheduling that union reps, that bus drivers, that other OC Transpo employees see must have an investigation. All right, I open it up to all candidates here. Look, tr transit is the future. It's the most efficient way to move people long distances through their neighborhoods and through the city, which means we need to bring more people onto our transportation system. It's a climate imperative, but it also reduces traffic and those road repair costs we were just talking about. I think we should start by restoring the cuts which slashed service in areas like Rideau View. Then we need to get transit running on time with more dedicated bus lanes. The only infrastructure cost to get those built and fix some of our scheduling problems is some paint. And on the LRT, we need to end the practice of using public-private partnerships to build and manage our system. We should either bring those maintenance contracts in-house or hire a new maintenance company that offers more reliability and transparency. But that's a great, I agree. The LRT has been a challenge. We need to look at that partner, uh, the LRT consort, consortium that's happened. We all know the inquiry is happening right now. What I'd like to see is that the inquiry happens and a strong look is done by council at all the recommendations. I think a lot of the recommendations that people probably think and talk about around a kitchen table or talk about with their neighbors and complain about, I'd like to see those recommendations be part of the final report. It's due out in November. That should give the council lots of time to hopefully include that in the budget. I know the budget's very quick after uh, the election. It's, I think it's 45 days. But the LRT inquiry is coming. I hope that the current council has planned for some extra money to be spent on that LRT because that LRT costs a lot of money. It's something we need. Every major city in Europe has one of those. Everyone loves it. Anyone who's traveled internationally, everyone loves the train. Everyone loves the subway. We need an LRT. We need a better uh, system to get us around in the big neighborhoods. We need to fix it. We can't change it. It's not going away. We can't tear it apart. It's here. We need to fix it. We need to make sure the current council that comes in is going to address that. Yeah, let's not forget that there was a, a majority on council that tried to block a public inquiry. I voted for a public inquiry, and thanks to the provincial government to getting that done. I also voted for the Auditor General to do an audit of the LRT contract and procurement. Uh, back to reliability, I do want to say that uh, I do believe in LRT. I do believe LRT is the future of our city. People need to move effectively through our city uh, on public transit. but. 
they need to be able to get to the LRT or transit way. So you need to have effective, reliable bus transportation, which takes people from their local neighborhoods to those major transit way or LRT hubs. And if people cannot rely on the bus schedule, if the bus is chronically late or is canceled and does not show up, they're going to make alternate arrangements. Okay, Riley, I'm just uh, just stop you because you'll have a chance to wrap. I'll come back to Ethan here. I totally agree with all of those points. The, the trouble is that in March 2021, Riley actually brought forward a motion to cut neighborhood transit routes that essential workers relied on throughout the pandemic. I know that we were in a fiscal crisis for our transit system, but that doesn't mean that reliability needs to suffer. We're home to some of the highest transit fares in North America as well, and uh, City Council, including Riley, has consistently voted to raise those fares. So I think that we need a, a consistent approach to uh, a, a reliable and affordable transit system. That's what I'd like to bring to Riverward. Alex, do you want to jump in here before Riley? I, I think Ethan right. said it pretty good. It needs to be reliable, it needs to be accessible, and it needs to, to, to show up at the hours. It needs to be there. You can't expect people to ride the bus and take it. I, I couldn't take the bus here this morning. For, for I, I live 11 minutes away from here, and I couldn't get here. It would have taken me like 40 minutes. And that's if the bus showed up. So if I can't expect that for myself, how can I expect everyone else? You know, you think it's as simple as missing the bus. Well, you're just going to catch the next one. But that's people's jobs. It's people's schools. It's people's livelihood. That's something as simple as having extra buses. It's not an investment in transportation. It's an investment of the people that are going to use the transportation so that they can help the city. I mean, the transportation, if you can't get from A to B, you can't do what you need to do. Very quickly. Ethan. A very quick last point. If we're talking about a transit system that works for everyone, we need it to be multimodal. All of our major states stations from the O train to the transit way need to have weather protected indoor bike parking spaces so that we can connect into our neighborhoods quickly and easily. Thank you, Ethan. Riley, uh, you have 30 seconds to wrap here. Yeah, through the new official plan, Ottawa wants to be the best middle-sized city in North America. No city can be vibrant, effective, growing, safe, strong, unless you have effective public transit. And I do believe that the LRT issues will be addressed and will be stabilized. I do believe the major reliability focus needs to be on the bus transportation network and to ensure paratranspo service is stable and reliable as well. All right, thank you all for that. Uh, we come back to you, Ethan, for this next topic. You'll have 45 seconds to open. The topic is policing. Um, we've heard from different candidates throughout this campaign with different views on policing, from freezing the budget to increasing the budget to reallocating some of those funds to other government agencies that are funded by the municipality. What are your thoughts on that? 45 seconds. Well, I start by looking at the numbers. In the last two decades, the police budget has tripled, outpacing both population growth and inflation. It's now one of the city's largest line items at over $350 million. It's also worth remembering where those discussions about police funding actually came from. In 2020, Ottawa saw a massive community response to police violence from George Floyd in Minneapolis to Abdirahman Abdi here in Ottawa. A central demand that I hear resonating in those protests was to create a new mental health response team separate from police. We need to stop spending expensive police dollars on drug use and homelessness and direct those in crisis towards a fourth emergency service with trained professionals who can help members of the public get access to wraparound services. We need to fight desperation and crime with housing and public health, with community services and poverty alleviation, and with good Th green jobs. Thank you, Ethan. All right, I open it up to all candidates here. I, 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 I agree. I mean, defunding the police is a, is a very simple statement, and I think there's a lot of misconception about it. I think people think they, they, they want to have less tax dollars spent on policing, but I think a lot of people are actually meaning they want to retool it. They want to make sure the mental health crisis is, or that people that don't need, um, you know, heavily armed police with riot gear to show up are, are, are served by members of their community that are there for, the, for their well-being, social workers, mental health care workers. We need to make sure that the police we, we, it's not going to be a transformation that happens overnight. It's going to take time to go from having police respond to something to social workers. There needs to be engagement with the community, there needs to be engagement with the police, and there needs to be dialogue directed by the City Council to make sure they put resources together so that if the end goal is to make a separate unit, they can do that, but they need to realize it's not going to happen overnight. I, I think we all agree that mental health is an issue that needs to be uh, properly addressed. But I think we need to also make sure that the, the men and women that are in uniform, that are police, that we aren't putting them at risk and saying defund the police and thinking that we're going to put a plan in place that takes uh, effect tomorrow and, and putting them in danger. That's not what we want. We want to make sure that, that the proper resources are there to, to, to help the people who need mental health assistance, but we need to make sure that we're not sacrificing putting other people at risk. Riley? Yeah, there's absolutely been a much needed discussion over, the, over recent years about police services, 
funding for the police and role of the police, and we need to continue that conversation. I do believe, though, we need to reframe that and start with what services do we want the Ottawa Police Service to provide the people of Ottawa? We need to agree on what those services are. Then you build your budget based on the services that we need as a city here in Ottawa. Absolutely, the chronic underfunding of social and health services across our city, across our province and country comes back to the police. When there's a crisis at three in the morning and those social and health services are closed, it has been defaulted to the police and that's not right. And they aren't the best organization to respond to people in crisis. Absolutely greater investment in health and social services across our city. That will certainly help address a number of residents who need help and make sure they get the best care and treatment that they need. It also frees up um, our resources, you know, like Ethan said, the police is an expensive organization. It frees up resources from that expensive organization to focus on the, the job that we want them. We want them to be there to respond, that when something happens in the middle of the night and you need to dial 911, you want to know that police officer is going to be there and not tied up with another call that's a secondary duty. Mental health response could be better served by another resource. It could be the fourth emergency service. It could be a different group altogether. But when we take police officers and we use them for other roles, we're taking them away from what we actually need them for. So I think, like Riley said, looking to see what the top-down approach, see what we actually want as a city, see what the residents actually want, and then plan a budget from that as opposed to just doing the, the status quo and, and looking how we can change things from the outside. Ethan? Yeah, and one of the ways that we can uh, make a difference in some of those services that we need without necessarily having to spend uh, huge amounts of money is with our streets. You know, there's real opportunities to address community safety issues without spending on police to do it. We can use automated speed cameras, we can build beautiful new traffic calming measures, and we can stop sending police to idle, uh, spewing gas into the air for hours on end at the site of new buildings. The solutions are there, we just have to implement them. Okay, Riley, go ahead. We do need an effective police service in the city of Ottawa. We do need police, there is a role for police. They are here to serve and protect, but they need to evolve. Many other organizations evolve over time, and certainly my perception and understanding of the police is they're significantly, they are reluctant to embrace the need for change over time and reflect the needs of their community. That must be part of the evolution of the Ottawa Police Service. They must reflect the needs of our city. And as I said a few seconds ago, we also need to see more significant investment in social and health services to help the people of Ottawa. Uh, another topic that needs to be touched on is the, the federal government. You know, we had that event that happened last year. Uh, I think there was a lot of eyes that were opened about uh, cross-jurisdictional policing. That needs to be a discussion that's had because whenever we adjust boundaries for work, we adjust boundaries for um, who's responsible. It all costs money. So I'd like to see that really talked about. And if the OPP and the Ottawa Police and the Parliamentary Protective Services are going to be working together, we need to make sure that those groups are paying their Thank fair you, share. Thank you, Alex. Sorry, that, that's all the time we have. Ethan, you have 30 seconds here to wrap. Yeah, Alex is exactly right. We need to talk about police accountability, whether it's on the convoy or on no-knock raids, which have led people to lose their lives here in Ottawa. It's time to ban this horrendous practice. And we can do this. Cities around the world and across Canada, even Toronto, have started to replace uh, some police services with mental health response teams. Cities are reducing and banning no-knock raids, and cities are not reinvesting in the services and infrastructure that keep people safe. The most important thing that we can do beyond just the new chief next term, is to ensure future budget allocations are not just spending on police, but on solutions we need to right. prevent violence. Thank you, thank you all. All right, let's move to the next topic. I'll, I'll start with you this time, Alex. Uh, you'll have 45 seconds. Let's talk transparency and public consultation. Many residents feel there's been a lack of that, that their views aren't being heard, and we're hearing a lot during this campaign about developer-connected individuals and, and donations and significant donations being disclosed. Um, let's talk about those subjects. You have 45 seconds. Yes, thank you. Uh, first and foremost, I think 100% the transparency needs to be there. I think uh, elected officials um, need, need to be uh, transparent with their uh, constituents. They need to be transparent with other people in their residence uh, in the city as well, even if you're not the specific councillor. If you're on a development board uh, and you're getting donations for a campaign, you should have to tell, say that before the campaign, uh, before the election. I would love to see it. Uh, I know myself, I can say that I have no developer contributions to my campaign. 
Uh, I'd like my two colleagues here to, to, to be able to say the same. They don't have to say it today if they want to, but I'd like them to say it before the election. Uh, the other thing that I think uh, we need to do a better job, whether it's as a city or at least as a ward. If I'm elected, there's going to be no more surprises. You know, developers have to go and put uh, signage out. The city goes and sends notices out to 120 yards or 120 meters for anyone in the area. Thank you, Alex. Sorry, um, I'll just open up. Uh, you, you can come back during the debate, but. It's open for everybody here. I think the city does consult people all the time. What it doesn't necessarily do is listen. You know, when I, when I speak to folks on their doorstep, they're clear that there's a, a serious deficit in democracy in our city and that this city council has pushed through major pro projects without adequate consultation. You know, when we're thinking about the civic hospital, it's a perfect example of this, uh, of this mess. Years of work and a proposal to put the site at Tiny's Pasture, and then the city strikes a backroom deal and moves it to Queen Juliana Park. And not just that, but in Montreal, they're building a, a new hospital that uses that has twice as many beds with 40% of the parking. We need a new and modern hospital, but it has to be space efficient and it can't rely on parking to fund its operations. That's what's cutting down trees. That's what's turning our park into a parking lot. And I'll just say also that, that on my campaign, we will not be accepting uh, donations from the development industry Riley? as well. Yes, absolutely. Engaging the public on uh, the multiple public consultations that exist uh, every weekend. The city publishes a number of uh, citywide and even wardwide uh, projects that are consultation on. I think there's consultation fatigue. People who are engaged in the process uh, have been asked to contribute and be part of many consultations over this term, but there's been significant issues. The official plan, the transportation plan, uh, master plan, the annual budget, all the way down to very uh, uh, localized issues in wards. So we need people to be engaged, but we also have to understand that most people aren't engaged and the city has to reflect on uh, innovative ways to reach out, particularly for people who aren't normally heard. It's very important to have a diverse uh, feedback and input from all residents of a ward of the city and not just people who are normally engaged. It's very, very important. So those innovative ways of outreach, as I said, have to be considered every time significant issues are before us. Alex? I agree. It's, uh, for all development, there's nothing worse than finding out that the development's been approved, uh, you know, the there, there's there's one development that's adjacent to the River Ward that uh, I've heard from numerous people. They were very surprised that uh, num numerous 30-story towers are going to be going up there. So you know the city has rules in place, and we have guidelines that say we're going to you know mail out, we're going to put signage up, we're going to mail out to anyone who's within X amount of meters of the, the the boundary. The city needs to do a better job, and as this ward, we need to do a better job. We're going to see a lot of development happen here, and probably in this term of council in the years to come. And we need to make sure that residents aren't surprised. You, you know you should never be surprised that there's a 30-story tower going up in your neighborhood. So if I'm elected, I, make, uh, I commit that I'm going to do a much better job in communicating out to the residents. If I need to go around and knock on doors or put signs up, you know, not 100 yards away, but 500 yards away so that people are next to their schools and people are next to their small community hubs and they're not going to just suddenly see giant uh, developments happen. People need to know where it is. It's fine and dandy to put it on Alex, the website. Sir, I, I just stop yep. you there because you'll be able to wrap. I'll just get Ethan sure. in here. Yeah, I think Riley is exactly right that we're experiencing consultation fatigue and I think one of the big issues here is that you know, when we build a, a small apartment building, a missing middle housing uh, that's able to keep residents uh, who are aging to live in place, that's able to provide affordable options, um, there's, there's extensive, extensive consultations. But when someone tears down a single family home, perhaps on that same lot, to build a mansion, no one really gets a say. So I think that we have a bit of an imbalance in terms of what we ask people to consult on in the city. Uh, and there's just so much knowledge and ex expertise embedded in our community. So our consultation process shouldn't be a drag. It should bring that out. It can help city staff identify issues, push developments to include better amenities, and resolve problems before they even pop up. I think the residents need to trust that the city can run democratically. Riley, do you want to jump in here? Yeah, to Alex's point about the radius that the city uses to inform people, I go many steps further. I have community consultations. We, we put out newsletters to 500 people in the immediate area. I also have a monthly e-newsletter, a printed community bulletin. I attend community association meetings where this is on the agendas. It's very, very important important to make sure people not just in the immediate vicinity of a development are aware but the vast people in the in the neighborhood who will be impacted all right thank you everyone uh, back to you Alex for 30 <coughs> seconds yeah thank you guys um, I think it's a great point you know we need to 
uh, not over inundate people with consultation. We need to give them the information that matters. So we can't just put it on a website. We can't put it in newsletters, emails. We can't inundate them with all the information, but give them none of the key facts. We need to find a way that's going to engage the the individuals that are already busy. They're already swarmed. They're trying to get back and forth to work. They're trying to fight to to get through the day as it is. They don't need to dig and uh, through a, a cumbersome system to find out what's getting built. We need to find an easy way to make sure it's in front of the residents so they know what's getting built next to them. Thank you, Alex. Thanks to to all three of you. We'll move on to the next topic. I know you've all touched on it, but I wanted to dig a little bit deeper because it's a big topic during this campaign, and that is the environment and climate change. And what role can and should a municipality like Ottawa play in combating climate change? Riley, you have 45 seconds to open. Every level of government has a significant role to play in combating our climate change and greenhouse gas reductions. It's simply not just for the federal government. Everyone is required to pitch in. We have declared this a climate emergency at City Council, Auto City Council. There are a number of initiatives that the city is doing. More, more funding obviously is important and this needs to continue on to the next uh, term of council. So the climate change master plan, we're focusing on city buildings. City buildings and transportation are significant contributors to greenhouse gas emissions. The city wants to look at its fleet of vehicles that it has, of course, LRT, electric powered, battery powered buses, significant investment in these two areas. Thank you, Riley. I open it to, to all candidates. We, we definitely did declare a climate emergency, and, but Riley's right, the funding is not there. Uh, if City Council stepped up and invested in our energy evolution plan, Ottawa would net $28.4 billion by 2050. But under the current leadership, <clears throat> that plan receives less than 1% of its required funding. We need to start retrofitting our buildings by, by investing in city-owned buildings like community housing and community centres and building up a local retrofit industry that can then go out and help homeowners. It'll lower energy bills and cut carbon pollution, but especially we need to stop sprawling as a city which spreads out our resources, costs more in energy and in taxes to maintain. We need 15-minute neighbourhoods, more walking and cycling infrastructure, new patios, new bike connections, everything that makes a city livable and fun. I totally agree with you, Ethan. Uh, you know, we, we need to go back to the federal government as well. You know, something the NCC um, just did recently, I don't know if you guys are aware, but last year they're doing a trial. They're going to ban small gas engines for all the landscaping contractors, all the contractors on site, across all the, uh, across the whole city. If you work on an NCC contract, you're not, you're not allowed to use a gas engine anymore. Why don't we do that as a capital city, as Ottawa? We're, again, we are the leading city in the country. We are the capital. We are one of the greatest, we are the greatest country in the world. Why aren't we leading edge green technology? If there's a new idea out there, we shouldn't wait for um, trials to be done elsewhere and see how it works in California or see how it works in Finland or see how it works in Sweden. If there's a new technology out there, we are the capital city. We should be embracing that. We should be the leading edge so that when we say, hey guys, it worked in Ottawa, why don't you try this in Montreal? Why don't you try this in Calgary? Why don't you try this in Halifax? We need to step up. You know, we, we, Climate change is, is not just tornadoes. It's going to affect, you know, if you think on a very high level, if climate change, if we keep getting warmer and warmer and warmer, we're going to lose the world's largest skating rink. And it's a very small thing to think we're going to lose a skating rink, but that's a huge deal. Think of the tax money that comes to the city just for people to come and skate on the rink and eat a beaver tail. We could spend that money now instead of losing it later. Right. Yeah, in addition to the building retrofix and uh, transportation network that I mentioned that the city's engaged in, we do need the provincial and federal governments to recognize that tax incentives for uh, building owners, homeowners, to retrofit their aged houses. We have many homes in River Ward that are now approaching 60, 70 years old. Those are major contributors to greenhouse gas emissions. There needs to be offsets for people who want to consider electric vehicles. There needs to be incentives to help people to go there. Talking about trees, as Alex just referenced, tornado, and then the direct show in May, we've had significant tree loss in the city of Ottawa. There has to be a comprehensive program the next term of council that will plant thousands if not hundreds of thousands of new trees for the carbon offset to improve the tree canopy, to improve the viability of our neighborhoods, but this has to be addressed. There's been significant damage in our city within a four year period, and it can't just be one year. It has to be spread out over the term. I'm just gonna cut you off yes. there, Riley, because you'll be able to wrap okay. here. I'll come back to Thank Ethan. You. I'm just gonna say as a, as a climate policy analyst, as someone who works on this uh, in my daily life, this conversation really cheers me up. I think that everyone on the stage does 
sincerely care about, about climate action. I think some more policies that I might throw out there are things like a public bike share program. You know, we're talking about looking at the best technologies around the world, but we can also look to our neighbors in Toronto, whose incredible bike to program has led to tens of thousands of new rides every single day. We can bring compost to multi-unit buildings to slash that organic waste that's now filling up our landfills and creating methane. And we can create Canada's first urban climate core to do things like take care of our tree canopy, plant new ones, and also install solar panels on city buildings and on big industrial buildings. Alex, do you want to jump in here? To yeah, thank you. I, I agree. I think when we plant new trees, we need to make sure we're planting them for the right reasons. I mean, we're in Canada. We've got lots of trees. We're very fortunate. There's countries that wish they could have 10% of our trees. So we need to make sure we're planting trees, not for numbers, not for carbon capture, but we're planting trees so that they're there for the generations to enjoy later on. A tree planted now that's five feet in 30 years is going to be a 30-foot tree. And we need to make sure that we're planting those trees and giving them the space so they can thrive so that when our kids and our kids' kids are here in the city, they get to enjoy them. And not just because we build dense forests, but we build parks and recreation facilities that have really nice trees. We should have trees. We could plant them downtown. We can plant them on rooftop buildings. We've got lots of opportunity to plant trees. All right, th thank you very much. Uh, Riley, over to you. You have 30 seconds to wrap. Think about what the ideal neighborhood means to you. It's a 15-minute neighborhood where you don't have to drive, where you have sidewalks and bike infrastructure, where your local park has amenities in it that your family can enjoy, where you have a corner store, again, that you can walk or bike to. You have tree canopy that shades you from the sun when you're at the park or when you're on your jog or out for your walk with your grandkids. This is part of what makes communities healthy and safe and vibrant. Trees are very important in that equation and we need to do more. Excellent, thank you all. All right, we're gonna change formats right now. Um, we're, we're coming out of the debate format. We're going to go into just a, a Q&A. So I'm gonna ask a question to each candidate. It will be the same question. Each of you will have 60 seconds to answer that question. Let's talk, uh, and I'll start with you, Ethan. Let's talk road safety, aggressive driving and speeding. It's something that, that councillors hear about all the time and they hear about it in, in, in this ward. What are some of the safety measures that you would, you would um, provide to, to neighborhoods? Um, I'll throw it to you for, for 60 seconds here, Ethan. Yeah, we, we need safe streets and we need traffic calming measures that actually slow down cars in our neighborhoods. Uh, the other day I was speaking to residents on Dines, which is a road that's been redone twice in just over a decade. And they said that the second set of changes has actually sped cars up with the addition of yellow paint on the center line of the road. Meanwhile, it's got white paint that's supposed to act as a bike lane, but I know people don't think that's safe because I saw multiple people riding on the sidewalk. Again, you know, we can look to our neighbors. We can look to Montreal who have created safe streets that mean, you know, steering around beautiful planters at the end. That mean narrowing our intersections so that cars can't just slip through and clip someone on the side. Uh, you know, I think that it's time for us to plan for zero road deaths and to build the infrastructure that we need to make that happen. Even in Capital Ward, just next door, one term councillor has brought every single residential street in the ward to 30 kilometres. And now, when staff are redoing the streets, they implement the designs that meet that standard. we got to catch up here in River Ward. All right. Thank you very much, Ethan. Alex, over to you. 60 seconds. Same topic. Hey, thank you. Yeah, I totally agree with uh, Ethan there. Traffic calming is very important. We need to slow the traffic down in residential neighborhoods. You know, we got to slow the traffic down in the school zones. We got to slow it down where we have people cutting across. You know, Canada is a country that is known for jaywalking. We are not going to solve that. You know, I've got two Ukrainians that moved here uh, in June, and I had to teach them how to safely jaywalk because you're in Canada. People jaywalk. It's something that you know, drivers need to know. And, and, and that pedestrians are aware of. So with that, we need to make sure that the traffic calming is there. We need to make sure that the speed limits can be lowered where they can. Let's force the traffic out to the arteries, get them out to the two and three and four lane roads, get them out to the hunt clubs, get them out to the main roads and get them out of the neighborhoods. Whether we restrict left turns across traffic lines so that we can keep the traffic out or whether we reduce traffic speeds, we need to come up with a plan that works year round. We can't just have a plan that works when there's not snow on the ground. We need to make sure the infrastructure is there, whether it's curbs, or whether it's signage or whether it's actual uh, hard delineation. We need to make sure what we put in place, we're putting in place and it's going to work year-round for everyone. Thank you very much. Alex, Riley, uh, same topic again, 60 seconds. Thank you. Uh, without any dispute, the number one safety issue in our ward and many wards across our city is road safety for vulnerable road users. It's a chronic concern. Uh, when roads are redesigned, when infrastructure work is underneath, they are rebuilt. On residential areas, they're, they're built to a 30 kilometer speed zone and there are permanent traffic calming measures that are implemented in those roads. But that's going to take many, many years to implement because uh, the roads are redesigned over time. 
Uh, traffic enforcement is a big one. I testified at Queen's Park to ask the province to allow municipalities to use speed enforcement technology. And we're still handcuffed because it's only permitted in school zones and safety zones. So while I appreciate that technology, municipalities need full control and authority on using this very important uh, enforcement mechanism. And the traffic calming budgets for wards is $50,000. And once you pay a labor fee, it's actually $38,000. So the next term of council needs to assign adequate funding for this area. Excellent. Thanks to all three of you. We'll go on to the next topic. I'll, I'll start with yourself this time, Alex. Uh, let's talk about uh, the budget because a lot of the things we've discussed here today cost a lot of money. Uh, where would you, I, I mean, people are worried about the growing debt. So where would you set tax increases over the next four years taking that into account? Do you have 60 seconds? Yeah, thank you. Uh, Unfortunately, a lot of the things that are uh, need to be improved with the city or be worked on do cost money. Uh, here, there's, there's, you know, the city's only got so many ways to to, to make or to, um, I guess, create money. We can cut services, we can raise taxes, um, or we can do a mix of both. And unfortunately, I think we do need to see a tax increase, but we need to be very cognizant that inflation is very high right now. So although we'd like to do it all this year, we'd like to do it right away. We need to put together a solid four-year plan. We need to make sure that this term council can make sure that the commitments they make can be done so that in four years, when it's time to re-elect the individuals, that they can be held accountable for whether or not projects were actually put through. So I think taxes do need to go slightly up, but we need to be very cognizant about that. Uh, we need to make sure that we're not just talking about mill rates. Uh, property assessments last happened in 2016. If we were to leave the mill rate exactly as it is, I think the city would have a... a uh, a very large amount of uh, cash influx so we need to make sure that when we're looking at it we're not just talking dollars and cents and the mill rates but how it's going to affect the individuals as well. Thank you Alex. Riley over to you for 60 seconds. The City of Ottawa budget is 4.5 billion dollars. That is a significant budget and before any budget is increased the onus is on the city manager throughout the year to look for efficiencies in the system and I don't mean cuts to core programs I just mean when you have a 4.5 billion dollar budget you should be able over time to find efficiencies that should be step one before you go to a tax increase you should look for efficiencies in that area budgets need to be stable and they need to be predictable but what's different the next term of council is what role will inflation play uh, with our budgeting the cost of goods and services but also our labor our labor agreements with city of auto employees over time if inflation is stubbornly high then there will be pressures on, on wages. So that has to be factored in when you're looking at perhaps year two, three, and four of the, of the next uh, term of council. But budgets need to serve the people for the services that they need. Thank you, Riley. Ethan, over to you, 60 seconds. Yeah, I would agree with, uh, with both Alex and with Riley. There is, there's a lot of upward pressure on our tax base right now. Um, I think that a big part of it is because of how we, we do spend our money. The biggest expense in the city, which is very hidden in our budget, is that big subsidy to sprawl. Each time we sprawl the city out, we cost residents in Riverward and across the core an extra $465 per year. That's because these new subdivisions that we're promoting require tons of new spending on infrastructure, water, fire, power. Not only that, but they end up putting thousands of cars on our roads, driving through our neighborhoods and degrading our infrastructure. The city also spends money simply subsidizing things we don't need. I was at a community picnic in Vanier to reject the $3 million deal to subsidize a new Porsche dealership. It was called a community picnic because the city dubbed the dealership a new community hub. Look, I think we should be subsidizing affordable housing and creating livable streets, not expanding car dealerships and promoting sprawl. All right, thank you all. We'll move on to the next topic. I'll start with Riley this time around. Um, there's an opioid crisis here in this city. Much of that leads to homelessness, which City Council unanimously uh, declared was an emergency. How do we tackle those two issues as a municipality? Riley, you have 60 seconds. Yes, this is, uh, thank you for the question. This is a very serious issue uh, in our city, impacting uh, many residents, but also many families. Uh, Ottawa Public Health is a critical tool and pillar in this fight. Uh, talks before COVID by the provincial government to actually cut Ottawa or public health agencies across this province and to consolidate them, reducing them in number, is certainly not the right direction. We absolutely need to help people who are opiate addicted and have other addictions and to provide them the social and uh, medical care that they absolutely need. 
Uh, living on the street is also not the appropriate place for any resident. And so as uh, people who are addicted to opioids and other addictions are being treated, they need safe uh, housing as well. Excellent. Thank you very much, Riley. Ethan, you have 60 seconds for the topic. Yeah, I think that I think that Riley is really hitting the nail on the head here. Uh, but we also need to talk about things like safe supply. We've seen uh, British Columbia, after municipalities throughout the throughout the province like Vancouver lobbied the provincial government, they were able to get uh, new safe supply, which means that people who are using drugs are able to access. Uh, a supply that's not going to kill them, um, which is a serious, serious danger. And uh, the best place to use those kinds of safe supply is at safe injection sites, and we can open more of those and fund the ones uh, that we really need. Uh, and, and of course, funding Ottawa Public Health properly is key. Uh, progressives for the past s several centuries, I would say, have been fighting for one of the key parts of, uh, of our municipal system, which is public health. Uh, without a strong public health response to our problems, we end up putting it once again in the hands of, uh, of criminalization. So I think uh, those mental health response teams that we all talked about earlier is also something that we desperately need so that people are getting compassionate uh, and professional service when they are in crisis. Thank you, Ethan. Alex, over to you. Hey, thank you. Uh, I think the opioid crisis is, is something that's uh, very challenging. It's very sad for uh, everyone that's been directly affected. Um, I'm from Newfoundland. I've got lots of, uh, I guess, uh, friends that I went to high school with, friends of friends. I probably can name 15 or 20 people that have uh, passed away from drug-related uh, incidences. I think it needs to be a, a multifaceted response. You've got to deal with the, the now, we need, which, which is the, the people that are currently on the streets, they're in the associations, they're in the shelters. We need to empower Ottawa Public Health to work with the Ottawa Mission. We need to give them to work with the Shepherds of Good Hope, the other great organizations that are already in the city uh, dealing with the, the, those challenges. We need to you know, find out and have frank conversations to find out what tools they need to get the job done uh, to help educate right now. And then we need to take it a step back further. We need to go to the high schools and we need to go to the community associations to make sure the education is done before the, the, the crisis happens. We need to educate children. We need to educate the neighborhoods of, of the problem to, to, to get the signs and deal with it before it becomes a, a, a bigger challenge. Excellent. Thank, thank you to all three of you. Um, let's move on to our closing statements. We'll do that in, in reverse order. So Riley Brockington, we, we start with you. You have 60 seconds for your closing statement. Thank you very much. Uh, when the lights went out in May of 2022, when our streets were devastated with downed trees, when there was no info from Hydro Ottawa, I worked 14 to 16 hour days, 10 days straight for you. When our city was occupied this past winter, I marched in minus 30 degree weather. I attended the Battle of Billings Bridge. I was there for you. When our COVID nightmare was upon us, we disseminated significant amount of information. We helped book vaccination appointments. I offered to drive people to their vaccination appointments. We called over 500 older adults to check in to make sure they were safe. I was there for you. When our LRT debacle happened, I called for a public inquiry. I called for the Auditor General to get engaged to make sure the system is reliable and taxpayers get the money, uh, the return on their money. I was there for you. On October 24th, I kindly request that you send me back to City Hall to be your effective, community-based City Councillor. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much, Riley. Alex Dugal, you have 60 seconds for your closing. Thank you. Um, I think the ward has a lot of challenges. The city has a lot of challenges. There's been a lot of good things that have been talked about here. Uh, what I pledge is to be open and available, uh, treat everybody uh, equitable, doesn't matter who you are, uh, what part of the ward you're from. Uh, I ask that uh, if I get elected that we approach things with a, an open uh, communication. If there's been challenges in the past, if you feel that you're not sure of something, if you elect me, that uh, we'll start on square one. We'll get things done. We'll work together. We'll, we'll, we'll work to make the ward a better place. We'll make the work, uh, make the ward and the city a much uh, better place. It already is a phenomenal place, but we need to make the decisions now that are gonna affect uh, the generations to come. Um, the key thing is, is that if, uh, if it matters to you, if you bring something forward, if it matters to you, it'll matter to me. I'll make sure that me and my team are there to address it, whether it's red tape that you're not sure how to apply for something at City Hall, or you're not sure uh, what's happening in your neighborhood. If something matters to you, I'll be there to make sure that I can get you the information and to make sure that I can lead you through uh, navigating the bureaucracy that is the red tape of politics. Thank you very much, Alex. And Ethan Savoray, you have 60 seconds for your closing. 
I really want to thank you, Derek, and, and thank you, Alex and Riley, for this fantastic debate. I want to be a counselor to take action on the major challenges facing our city. I know the solutions are right here in Riverward. I want to champion climate action with a Green New Deal, renew trust in the city and expand what's possible here in Ottawa. Where previous councils cut transit, we can restore it with services that show up on time, services that people want to use. Where community resources have been underfunded by years of austerity, we can reinvest in quality care. And where affordable housing has been co-opted by big developers, we can build non-profit options for all. Our ward is a diverse and dynamic part of the city. It represents five neighborhoods that span not just the river, but some of Ottawa's most important landmarks from the experimental farm to Mooney's Bay. What's good for River Ward is good for the city. Building sprawl that puts thousands of new cars on our roads drains the city budget. That's not good for River Ward. This, the same old approach is not working for River Ward. I know that in Ottawa, if we work for it, we can move forward and create a green, compassionate, and accessible city for everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Well, thank you. Thank you very much to all the candidates. Excellent job, and I, I wish you all the best of luck. And of course, thank you at home for watching. If you want to tune in and find out more about what's happening around the city and other debates, rogerstv.com will have all of the debates for you. A reminder, Election Day is October 24th. Thank you so much for tuning in to your local campaign.